on this episode of White Wine Question Time. Sarame, fellatio, <laughs> cunnilingus. <laughs> When Janet Jackson came out, you know, like when Madonna came out, it's kind of like, there's nothing, I can't do that. I can't dance that good. And I definitely can't sing that good because I couldn't sing like them. I thought I couldn't sing well. Celine Dion, I got to sing in Vegas. I got to sing a uh, ACDC song with her and she's playing air guitar off her leg and I'm laughing. We had just started working together for a couple of years and bam, cancer came back again. Then the double mastectomy happened and I was out, you know, tour was gone. Hello and welcome to White Wine Question Time, the podcast that asks its guests three thought-provoking questions, usually over three glasses of wine. But today there is an ocean between me and my guest. She is a powerhouse singer, a campaigner and an entertainer who first stormed the charts in the early noughties with huge hits like I'm Out of Love and Left Outside Alone in a career that's seen her sell more than 52 million records and have number one hits in 19 territories. Born in Chicago in 1968 to a Broadway actress mother and a cabaret singer father, her parents split when she was very young and she relocated to New York with her mother and two siblings where she enrolled at the Professional Children's School. At 13, she was diagnosed with Crohn's disease, which marked the beginning of a difficult health journey she continues to navigate, but she refused to let it dent her ambitions to work as a dancer. And before you knew it, she was appearing on Club MTV and in videos for the likes of Salt and Pepper, before singing quickly replaced dancing. And she was performing backup vocals for the likes of Paula Abdul and Jamie Foxx, as well as singing at weddings. And when I say weddings, I mean like big weddings, Steven Spielberg's wedding, Arnold Schwarzenegger's birthday party. And for a moment, she was even in a band with Michelle Visage. But it was on the MTV talent show, The Cup, where she caught the attention of Michael Jackson, yeah, and Lisa Left Eye Lopez from TLC, not to mention Sony Records, who signed her. In 2000, her debut single, I'm Out of Love, and her debut album, Not That Kind, sold over 7 million copies, and she set about touring the world, performing in territories as far flung as Australia and Germany, where she still remains a superstar. But in 2003, her career came to an abrupt halt when she was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of just 35. She immediately underwent treatment and within a year was back on stage. Unfortunately, 10 years to the month of her first diagnosis, her breast cancer returned. And this time, she wasn't messing around. She opted for a double mastectomy and not long into her recovery, decided to take part in Strictly Come Dancing in a bid to reclaim her femininity. Now 55, she lives in Denver and she's just released her latest album. It's called Our Songs and it's a compilation of 12 English interpretations of massive German hits from 1980 to 2020. I can't wait to hear more about it. Let's dial her in. It's the rather wonderful Anastasia. Thank you so much for rescheduling this. I should explain. We were due to speak like a week ago and I um, ended up in hospital in A&E for the day. I cut my head open. Exercising. Stupid. Uh, Who says exercise is good for you? So thank you. Thank you for coming back. So listen, you're in Dusseldorf today. You spend a lot of time in Germany. In fact, the whole album is born out of this kind of, I mean, the, the Germans love you in the same way that they love David Hasselhoff. You are almost an honorary German. Go figure. I uh, I am the female David Hasselhoff, and I'm very proud. Um, can't go running on a beach, but so what? Um, I <laughs> very very inspired, very excited to have been given the opportunity to do a project which no one wanted to do. I don't think anyone thought, "Oh gosh, I think I want to take German songs and translate them and make an album." because that's what the world needs. Uh, It was a scary project to start and to think could be successful. However, I got a couple of songs, well, the first song delivered to me from the actual artist himself, um, a band called Die Totenhosen, which his name is Campino. And he actually is uh, German and English. So I did not know that. I thought he was just German. So he sends me a demo. He translates his song. It's called Best Days. And I'm like, the guy singing this is amazing. He's like, these are the best 
guys full on Liverpool. And I'm like, this guy should be a singer. And they're like, well, it's, it's the, Him? it's the guy in the band. <laughs> I'm like, what? And I was like, no, nice he's so he's a real punk artist. So it really right. made sense. Um, and it showed me that his wonderful song could then be something I could relate to where I enjoyed the melody of the song, but if you don't understand it, yeah. it's a really different language to hear musically. I think hip hop, it's cooler when you rap in German. I really feel there's an essence of that staccato works, but singing, I always felt that there was something that I couldn't connect with until I took the songs and broke them up to just music and medley, melody. And yeah. didn't quite think about, well, you know, how does it sound, all of these structures, uh, and just thought, is this a good song, point blank. Uh, and I, that's how I found songs. And then the translations came after I found out what they meant. And I was like, oh, I love this song. And they're like, it says this. And I'm like, I don't like that song. <laughs> There are certain things willing to say, willing not to say, but it has to be on my plane of thought. So what's, what's it like, though, um, having this dual existence where you live, you live back in the States where you, absolutely you can still work and you still sell records, but really your, your, your territories, your markets where you are kind of, you know, immediately noticed on the streets are oh, yeah. foreign lands. That's, I would imagine for your mental health, that's really cool. Like you it, can be both. Yes. The best of both worlds. I, at the beginning, did I feel that way? No. You know, you no. want to be known in your, you know, your home. You want to feel like you can bring it back to your people. And um, it was a whole different thing that I didn't have control of. It was a record company, radio station, Palava. And so I, I went with it, but in essence, I talked to Bono and I talked to Beyonce and I talked to a bunch of other people that I have been in the works with during my peaker times. And they're like, I would wish for a country that I could just roll around in, especially as big as America is. And I go under the radar, yeah. you know, like I'm not saying a hundred percent, but relatively unassuming, uh, there isn't like people speak English in America. They all kind of can sound like me and there's yeah. blonde out there all the time. So when I'm in Germany, my voice completely, the minute I'm like, can I have a Starbucks? They're like, Anastasia, you know, it's like, yeah, there she is. <laughs> <laughs> recognizable i if i had your accent i could probably you know get away with it yeah get away with it now yeah yeah and, and how is life in germany because you spend an awful lot of time there and all of the territories where you still can i mean like i should really point out to people you sell a lot of records to this day around the world you have a phenomenally successful long-standing career and congratulations on that because thank you hard to pull off in this day and age no thank you very much i i have a very loyal fan base and um and i have written albums uh plural and they don't have to be at the top of the charts to necessarily impact uh, a show and when people come out, if they don't know there was an album, then all of a sudden there'll be a spin, you know, and in, in a territory and you're like, yeah, they didn't know that song was out there. So <laughs> I always do try to perform the hits that they want to hear. Yeah. In that, there's a bunch of songs that I can go in and out of being able to put in my set list. And each new album becomes the, the, beauty of shining with that but then there's a you know if there's a hits tour there's a hits tour if i don't have a few albums you know in the mix yeah well more power to you Thanks. more power to you so listen i've tried to devise three great questions for you today and um i wanted to give you your a, a run at the first one with hopefully a slightly easier task than selecting the songs that you had to come up with in German for your album. So here we go. Question well, I one. hope the hell, Jesus, you are. Yeah, I think you did really well on that. I'm going to make this a load easier for you. <laughs> okay. The songs on the album span 40 years, so from 1980 to 2020. But I wondered, what are the songs 
the soundtrack, the big milestone moments from your life across those 40 years? Oh, my goodness. Um, that's a harder question, girl. Is it? Yes. Um, I've been influenced by so much music, and I think it is how I grew up, not my desire to go to that music, but what my parents were listening to and what yeah. radio station was on the car. So when I was young, my, my family actually had their record player and the albums that were basically huge, huge catalog of was Barbara Streisand and Elton John oh. and the musical hair. Now, if you don't know the musical hair, there's a lot of songs that should not be sung by right, children, girls, but <laughs> every word. And my mom said that she laughed all the time because my sister and I would often sing it. And I, you know, I don't think I should be singing it here. I don't know if your audience you can. Yeah, no, okay. go for it. So the first few lines of this one song is Sodome, Fallatio. <laughs> Conalingus, <laughs> everlasting mama. Why do these words sound so nasty? <laughs> Masturbation. I mean, you have to listen to this song and realize as kids, we'd put our pantyhose on our heads so that I have like a long piece and we'd like, can be fun. <laughs> Masturbation can be fun from the mouth of a babe. Sliding on the floor, <laughs> it was uh, to be observed. Jeez, yeah, I'll say. So you grew up with, yeah, I mean, listen, it was sex education and a musical interlude all in one go, right? No idea that the words were bad for so no. long. For so really? long, maybe into my 20s when <laughs> I think maybe we heard it again and maybe my sister brought it up and we had put on the song or maybe we had watched the movie again and we were like, oh my God, I know every word. This is horrible. <laughs> like, of course my mom thought it was funny. You know, well, your mom she, was a Broadway star, right? So your mom was into the musicals and the yeah, big diva singers. Musicals, and, and she also was the kind of woman that wouldn't look at that and be like, oh geez. You yeah. know, she actually could, uh, she accepted everything in a, in a very open open way. So she thought that was humorous because we had no idea. We just thought it was a beautiful song <laughs> as kids. You know, so and there's then that one. Playing- so that's your childhood soundtrack, Anastasia. <laughs> right. And then with Elton, I would play the piano on the back of the couch, you know, as I wow. slide in my socks. You know, like I would sing his music, but I would use the back of the couch, you know, and we had wood floors and the back of the couch was there and I I'd slide and act like I was playing the couch. It was just fun little moments. And Barbara Streisand, I mean, I could stare at her hands and her beautiful face all day and her long legs. I mean, there's just a list. I thought she was effortlessly beautiful. And then how she sang also made me just feel like, wow. And at that point, never did I think I'd be a singer. I didn't dream of that. That wasn't in my DNA. Um, But... I could sing and I was aware, but I thought everyone sang. That was my right. ignorance. Yeah. My dad sang, my mom sang, my sister didn't like to sing. She was too shy, but I thought it was, she's too shy. She doesn't want to sing, but right. it's really, I, she's like, I can hold the key, but you don't want to hear me sing. Like there isn't that. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so yeah, I do believe it comes from either within or, Maybe Sean's could have been nurtured out. You just never really know. But. Yeah, listen, I, I have zero ability to sing. I don't think you could nurture any sort of sound out of me that would be melodic. But I think it's a gift. And I, I'd love to know what are the songs. Well, okay, so dancing was your thing, right? You're at the professional children's school in New York. Your mom and dad have split up. Um, you know all about <laughs> masturbation and all of the good stuff but then as a teenager what's the what are the what are the songs that soundtrack that those teenage years where you start to find your feet as a dancer and heading out into the clubs of new york city definitely in my world in new york it was a lot of uh house music and yeah. freestyle so it was a lot of latin artists and um that kind of essence of 
don't even know how to describe that to an avid listener because freestyle was New York. Um, the, the dance music, um, was really evident there. And I go to a lot of clubs and that, that was just always played house music, um, all night long. Say what? House music all night long. All night long. Yeah. Are you so, talking about like Steve Silk Hurley and Jack Master Funk? Um, Frankie Knuckles. See, that's what I'm saying. Yes. Oh, I, Tears. Still such a great track. You've got it. You've got it 100%. Yeah. It was just a, a catalog of that going on in my head. And then on the other end of not going to that music, then I had like, you know, uh, newer artists that like when, when Janet Jackson came out, you know, like when Madonna came out, it's kind of like, I'm not worthy. There's nothing. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. I can't dance that good. And I definitely can't sing that good because I couldn't sing like them. I thought I couldn't sing well. Yeah. You know, because they're on the radio. So I need to sing like that in order to get on the radio. So it was, it was interesting. Um, and I think even in my development, I would try to sing like people. So I was yeah. very vanilla. So I don't think people really knew what my style was because I try to cater to what they were looking for as well. So how did the bridge come from dancing and, you know, populating the clubs and getting on things like Club MTV and dancing in salt and pepper videos to actually stepping up to the mic? And, you know, you you ended up working the wedding circuit, but in true Anastasia style, you did like you did Steven Spielberg's and, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's birthday. You just went high, babe. You didn't go low. <laughs> yeah, I know, unfortunately. But I actually went from New York, I ended up going back to LA because I couldn't afford living in New York by myself in my mid twenties, around 26. And, and that's when I got connected to more producers that really wanted to help me try to get into the singing and being able to cover CC Peniston and Shaka Khan and Otis Redding and all of these, like, you know, uh, maybe staples, whatever it was, it was just going and singing songs that to be honest, never did I know what the words were. I had to learn those words to the songs. And in fact, didn't quite, and I'm so honest with this, never really knew that she was spelling respect the second time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God. I know what it means to me and you might believe in me like I had no idea. no idea so I was like she spells respect oh my god that's so brilliant how cool is that so oh my was, god that's hilarious needless to say but a part of who I am is just real oh. something and going yeah of course yeah. she did you know. Yeah, but you listen, you, every, life's a journey of learning, yeah. right? It really is. So what would, so you'd be singing these songs as like the wedding singer and the birthday party singer. Yeah. So that was where I was singing those kind of yeah. songs and, uh, the kind of band that I was with where I was more or less the front lead singer. And then there were two guys also that sang. Um, so we were doing three part harmonies. A lot of the time they would take it a lead. I would take a lead very much easier than being a single singer. Just saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, and so this wasn't the band with Michelle Visage. That was another no, thing. No, no. This with, with Michelle, we were trying to do a four girl group, but it was just, you know, her and I were kind of, they wanted to have us do the parts that weren't what we would normally do. Like I would have been a soul singer and she would have been like Madonna but mm -hmm. they wanted her to be the soul singer and wanted me to be Madonna. And I'm like, and we were both looking at each other like, yeah. it would not. Like, I'm like, I don't know how to do that. And she's like, I keep telling him he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but, you know, um, but needless, it was a wonderful opportunity and we have a lot of fun stories about it, but. Um, didn't work uh, out. Yeah, it didn't work out. So if you're singing all of these big hits and you're doing the party circuit, um, well, how do you start to even discover your own voice when it comes to getting the deal? Because that's, that's got to be tricky. That's what helped me because I, I wasn't 
made to sing like Shaka Khan. I wasn't made to sing like any of the other artists. I was mm. singing all these different artists. And I think eventually my own tone came out, my own yeah. vibe. I don't know it was coming out. I don't know that I was being aware that it sounded the way it sounds now. But I have to say that forward to actually getting the deal and being on a TV show that got me the deal, the first time I ever saw myself sing visually, it, like as someone recorded me and I could watch back, was when I was on that show. No. And I was like, so I'm going, oh my God, it's freaking weird. But mainly because it really, it, at the beginning, if I remember, everybody was really shocked that I sounded like I did. Yeah. It was quite a, whoa, wow, that's, I wouldn't have expected that voice out of you. And blah, blah, blah. I thought the same thing. So this empty jaw kind of dead look in someone's eyes was not constipation. <laughs> It was shock of positivity, but I was like, are they in well? <laughs> I'm like, oh no, they're going to completely shit on themselves. So it was a good thing that they were shocked, but I think at, at a certain point, I kind of got that it is wild to hear me. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's brilliant. It's brilliant. I mean, you were a real late comer in terms of realizing your own potential. Oh, yeah. And by this point as well, I mean, I, I should point out, because we recently had a, a, a one of the pro dancers from Strictly on the show, uh, Amy Dowden, who talked about her experiences with Crohn's and how, I mean, I mean, how the, how the hell do you become a dancer and then a singer? And how do you continue to tour to this day when you are constantly living with this monkey on your back, which is Crohn's, right? Which can kick you in the ass at any time. Most people did not know how ill I was during the first, like, I want to say like more the, the second year, third year, fourth, like into the sixth year, I was really quite ill a lot, therefore quite small. And that was not my maybe perfect body. Um, but I still considered myself big in my head because I did, I wasn't tall and I wasn't a model and, you know, I wasn't the pretty girl. I was the rock punk chick. So I, I definitely was unwell at times. So how you did it? I mean, like, how do you, to this day, how do you plan a tour when you don't know when that might flare up and take you away from from your good health um, and your ability I to, to perform. Say that, um, I have been very, very lucky that when I was able to start really focusing on my mental health, and I mean making sure that I'm not holding things in and I'm not just appeasing the people and I am really trying to understand my own inner thoughts, that they're no longer trapped inside and eating away at me. They are, I, I'm helping process them. Therefore, when they're out of my body, it's not as emotional. Then the body doesn't get weak. Yeah. And, you know, it's always when you're stressed and when your head isn't in a good place, um, mm. but you think you're fine, you know, mm. and then it's too late. The attack happens and you kind of have to, ride your wave, but I'm, I'm pretty much symptom free. I mean, and that's crazy wow. to say, I'm not going to say I won't ever have an attack. My last oh, attack for you now. That's amazing. Yeah, my last attack was five years ago. Wow. Um, and you know, but I do have my, you know, I, I do have my levels where I have to be careful because I know something's not well, but maybe I'm not in a bad place, but I'm like, I just got to watch this. Um, and, That's really uh, encouraging to hear. Five years. I mean, I know you've had other yeah. health issues in that time. In fact, where, do, where does music oh, sit God. with you? In, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just a bit. Thank God. I was um, like, you know, dealing with one disease at a time. Yeah, okay, yeah. I'm going to park that disease because, whoa, <laughs> the other one's back. Um where does music sit with you in illness? Do you, do you fall into music? Do you, are there songs that you go to, to kind of, you know, help you medicate the soul or do you stay away from music? 
the interesting part is, is that I've written albums after major illness stuff. It seems, um, I don't know if it was because it was supposed to happen. And then all of a sudden the health problem happened. So then I just kind of stuck with as much of the schedule as I could on the days that I could. So it then became hard, but it also became cathartic because it would help Mm. process feelings and emotions and it would be a way of getting them out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I suppose there are are there songs that you go to that I suppose when you are having those treatments and you've had some pretty rough treatments across the years with Crohn's and breast cancer, double mastectomy, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. Yeah. Are there songs that you go to that just calm, soothe, heal? To be honest with you, silence heals for me. Mm -hmm. I, I really like, I like silence. I think my life is not silent and I'm not necessarily silent. So silence is a big plus. Is this a bit like asking an accountant, would you get a spreadsheet out after a big operation? Cause it soothes you. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> kind well, of. <laughs> you know, a musician may go write a whole album after they get off stage. I completely get that philosophy. I don't know whether it's from having Crohn's disease for so long that the doctor did give me advice to make sure you try to keep yourself calm, try to keep your head, try to get your emotions out. And that was so early in like the younger kids having Crohn's at that point, Mm -hmm. you know, it was quite different. And now there's so many more people that, that have Crohn's and, 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 uh, in the Crohn's family, shall we say colitis or irritable bowel, any of them, they're really quite stress related and food related and the food Mm. hurts it. So you got to eat, but the problem is, is that to pass it, it hurts. Um, so either you can't pass it or it passes really, really well, but too well to make a plan. So, and Crohn's is not a sexy thing to talk about, which I really feel bad for people is that it's not, the subject, you know, anyone wants to necessarily talk about on a talk mm. show for 10 minutes when you have an interview. So it's always a quick moment, but yeah. I really but it's, it's a, tell my cronies, it's, I tell people that I know, which I call cronies, that cronies. they really have to look at their inventory in their own self and say, who do you have around you that is doing good by you? Who do you have that's not doing good by you? Are there people pressuring you? Are there, is there work happening that you really don't feel connected to? Like you really have to be the driver of the car you're in, which is your own spirit and realize that you're going to only know what is happening inside of you. We won't. And unless you're honest with yourself or can find that, you then will try to be the best patient you could be. Yeah, because your health literally depends on it. Yes. Yeah, they're probably very good practices yeah. that all of us could employ, actually. We could all learn from you cronies. Question number two for you. Super simple. Pinch me moments across the last 25 years. The ones that make you stand there and look down on yourself and go, stick a fork in me. I am done. This is it. I hate to tell you, I have so many good ones. So that is a long list. Great. Of, Let's do this. There's so many. Let's do it. Um, singing with Pavarotti. Um, and <sighs> he's, he sang Italian, uh, my song, I Ask of You. He sang part of it in Italian. I sang my part in English. And we literally, like, I just couldn't even believe I was wow. doing that. Um, singing with Elton John. Yeah, I mean, listen, you're the young girl that used to mimic him in your your living room playing the sofa totally. your piano. Playing piano while I'm singing to him. It was it was yeah. a whole full circle moment for me. Um, and he's and he's you know what? Once he's got your back, he's always got your back. He's he's fiercely loyal, Elton. He's a big supporter of new music, and he's such a great person to make a young artist feel like they belong and he he's good choice of music he is so whenever he brings somebody on his 
a podcast or whatever he's advertising, whether it's an interview or something, I'm like, who is this person? Let me look it up right now. Cause I know I like this person. Yeah. 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 I think you're quite right. Another is Celine Dion. I got oh. to sing with her in Vegas. I got to sing a, uh, ACDC song with her. <laughs> uh, shook me all night long. Go for two girls, just two girls singing ACDC as we do. Um, so yeah, wow. it's such an, it was just, it, we were on the same label. So I had met her before and spoken to her before, but the fact that we were able to share a song on stage together that is still out there in the world recorded and on an actual CD that it's, it's trippy to know that I've had an experience mm-hmm. with her and she's just delightful and lovely. Yeah. Yeah. I worked with her in the early days of her career and she was utterly charming beautiful woman, super kind. Yeah. Yeah. And so loved her husband. I felt so sad when she lost him. And, and, you know, Mm. I think that, uh, she, if I could think of what she's feeling, she had such a love that if it was a choice to have the love or never have the love at all, hands down, you know, she had the love for many, many years she has the children representing that love. Mm. Like I, I know she's the kind of person that would feel blessed with that. And I didn't ask her or nor have I asked her, but I think she would be the type of person yeah. and if she's ever said it, that, you know, she's abundantly blessed. Um, even in the face of what she's facing now, mm. just, I know she finds a way to find blessings in it. She has to, cause that's her nature. She's just amazing. So when you're stepping up to, um, you know, a show like that and you're thinking, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do ACDC today with Celine Dion. Is there a part of you that ever just doubts your ability to to do it? Is it too big a moment for you or? You know, I don't. Okay. So the truth of that was she wanted to sing that we had, it was divas live. So mind you, all these superstars. Oh, VH1 divas. Right. So we're Love talking uh, Mary J. Blige, Cher, Shakira, mm-hmm. Dixie Chicks. Uh, I'm, I'm losing names, but many, many great singers. And she wanted to sing that song. And I think probably asked other people before me. This is just my, in my head, what happened. And the matter. I don't think she got any biters. <laughs> and I was like, sure. And sh- I think she was totally excited that someone um, said, oh, good morning. Good, good morning. Uh, Did something- hello, who's that? Oh, this is Brody. Oh. He just woke up from a- Hey. Oh, no. Oh, what a cute dog. Oh, he's really kind of a, a blessing to have. Hello. All right, go he back. He travels the world with you. Yes, he does. You're like Sharon Osborne. She takes dogs everywhere. I know. I'm the lady. I'm the crazy lady with the dogs now. But um, it's all right. It's, worth it's things so to do. great to travel on the road with a dog. I never knew what that was like. And now I don't think I could ever live without it. Oh, that's nice. He's beautiful. But yeah, then, then we decide to do ACDC. And she's playing air guitar off her leg. And I'm laughing. Um, but I really felt like we both took it on as singers, not trying to be Metallica or, you know, a crazy rock band essence, yeah. you know, we just took it on and saying, this is a great song. So I didn't feel the pressure until probably, you know, people were like, you sang ACDC. And I was like, should I not have, you know, <laughs> I think when I'm not given the opportunity to overthink it, my first reaction is great as mm. long as I don't have people in my ear giving me things to worry about. That's why I don't necessarily like a competition because I feel I'm not great at that. I get people get in your ear and there's a little bit of, Mm. I'm not a competitive person. But you have just one more singer in Australia. Come on. Yes, you're right. But this is where that's different. I was competing with myself. Yeah. And anonymously, isn't that joyous to be singing behind a mask? It was awful, to be honest, oh. <laughs> because I couldn't sing to anyone. I couldn't be fun. And 
charming and and appreciating everyone's hard time and all the work they're putting in and thanking people. I just stood there like as if that's your job. And I felt so uppity. I felt like I was being so rude by not appreciating people because that is a part of what makes me happy. So as I was yeah. in it, I kept thinking every time I would do a song, I was going to go away because you didn't hear anyone. You didn't know. And of course you're going to yeah. go, you know, you don't know what's happening. You don't hear yeah. the other singers. You don't, you just know how hard it is for you and you can pick apart your routine. You can pick apart your vocal and you miss that dance move or, you know, by the end my cathedral that I had on my head with it, like literally, <laughs> I think your cathedral the was like hanging down because I was head banging it by the end of the, you know, show <laughs> where I thought it was so heavy. I was going to be top heavy and go everywhere. Um, yeah, it was great. They are some pretty awesome pinch me moments. I think you've collected well. Oh, there. I know. I'm really, really happy. You know, with more to come, I hope, you know, more moments along the you way. Know, I have so many that I could still say. So if there weren't, I'd really feel that I had a super good roster, you know, Bono, Beyonce, um, Paul uh, M- McCartney. Paul McCartney. I, I do have a lot. And, you know, the more I, up uh, Jamiroquai, I mean, I can, I, I forget half the ones that yeah. actually happened. Um because it's just, oh my God, you're right. Yes, I did. So I'm truly, truly grateful that I, that those artists would want to sing with me, that we decided to sing together. And even in Germany, I'm singing with an absolute amazing artist. And we did a duet. His name is Peter Maffe. And he is the Bruce Springsteen of Germany. We are touring this summer mm-hmm. in stadiums just in Germany. I think it's like 15 wow. stadiums in Germany, you know, like it is. Wow. Yeah. He's not a, not a small artist and he is extraordinary, but never did a duet with anyone in his life. And I took one of his biggest ballads, biggest songs in his career and translated it to English. And now we have an amazing love song that translates into his daughter's you know, new, she's a six-year-old, five-year-old girl who loves English and she loves German and she loves Frozen and she's all about, you know, hearing daddy's song in English. That's so nice. Yeah. That's so nice. Well, Gav, wow, you really are going all guns blazing. Congratulations. Thank you so much, sweetheart. I love to hear this all these years on. Final question. I hope you like this one. Oh, boy. Okay, my third and final question. I'm going to give you three cards to write. Two that say thank you on the front and one that says screw you. I want to know who you're going to address them to and what they're going to say and why. Um, I mean, I'm super grateful for my sister uh, and I will say family yeah. being a big part of that. But my sister and I work together. And she has been on the ride the whole way and she has helped me stay grounded. Um, And then probably it's kind of hard. It's like, would I put friends, my closest friends and my sister and my, my posse in a group? Because I don't know that I'd be me without them, but then there'd be my manager who has completely changed my outlook on the way that somebody sees me as an artist and how to uh, look in the eye of the storm and go, we'll get through it. And this is Craig. This is Craig Logan. We had just started working together for a couple of years and bam, cancer came back again. We had just did this amazing covers album. We were going to have a great tour. It was absolutely praised and loved. And then the double mastectomy happened and I was out, you know, tour was gone and he, and I was like, Oh God, he's going to want to let, he's just going to want to be like, it was nice being your manager, but right? you're a lot of work. Um, and he just <laughs> had ri- ridden every storm, he's been, you know, the, uh, 
the heart storm, the Crohn's storm, the, all the health storms, you know, he just sees me bounce back each and every time. And I think he's always like, there'll be a pause, but she won't stay down very long. <laughs> I'm glad that. So you've got, we've got Craig, we've got a letter to your sister and your posse. Yeah. Can I suggest for the screw you card that you send it to the menopause because I've heard you talk only briefly about your experiences, but it sounds like it really put you through the ringer. In fact, I'd love to open up on that with you as a breast cancer survivor. So many people think that menopause treatment, HRT, any kind of treatment is, is a no go. And that's not been your experience, has it? I, I didn't even realize I was going through such hell that it was caused by menopause. I didn't know my exhaustion. I didn't know my brain fog. I didn't know all the things. Mm -hmm. I just thought I was tired. I just thought, you know, my migraines were sinus related. I did not know. And I think the more that mm -hmm. we can share with younger women, and I mean 40s, um, that go get your hormones checked. Go see where you're at in the spectrum. Don't think of it as yeah. negative. You just need, you need food for your woman's body. Cause right now your woman's body is going to starve itself and you don't know it's starving and you think you're just tired and you think you're uh, short and you think you're foggy and losing a little, I thought I had early dementia girl. I was diagnosing myself, mm -hmm. but had no idea any of this was mm -hmm. hormone related. So for me, the same I did for breast cancer, it's on me if I don't talk about it. It's on me if I don't share with other people that this was hell. And had I known it was, I would have probably helped myself out earlier, um, knowing that there was a way to Same. relieve it. Like there is a way to relieve this exhaustion, fog, everything. But I guess I was waiting yeah. for that ball to drop. And my ball was, I thought I had a brain tumor and life was going horrible. And I was really, really scared. Uh, and so when I got all of these other things checked out, like this guy in Switzerland was like, I think you're going through, you know, some hormone stuff. And I was like, I don't know. It doesn't feel anything like that. I'm like, I have hot flashes. I'm okay with that. Like in my head had no idea the things I was going through were actually in the list because it's a long mm -hmm. list. It's so long. It gets longer all the time as well. And I, I think you're right. You know, we just need to know what to look out for. Cause I had, I, listen, I went and had scans. I thought I had arthritis. I thought I had oh. on, early onset dementia. Um, yes. You really, you lose yourself. You lose yourself. Yes. And, and it's scary and lonely and sad and, it is if you can share that experience or know yes. that it know what it is you'll be you'll be so much better for it yes. and then you can educate yourself and make decisions around what treatments work for you right. having had breast cancer it's so lovely to be able to talk to you about this because people go oh but you know oh i've i've got the BRCA gene or i i've had breast cancer i can't take hrt there are other ways to treat menopause and you are walking talk and proof of that exactly your body is lacking and losing things that if whoever you're working with, whatever hormone doctor you're working with, doesn't mean hormones are what he's going to necessarily prescribe you. He's going to help facilitate the best balance to you. You can be in this phase that you're going through. Which changes all the time, by the way. But so, so you can't take body identical HRT, but I do believe you I, use bio identical. I, is that right? I had be, uh, my my cancer never got to my lymph nodes. So it never got inside my body. It only stayed localized. So I never had to take the meds because I was too young for the first cancer. For the second cancer, my detection was also earlier than my DCIS that they were able to know that it was cancerous, but we just want to take that out and lumpectomy it. And But then you, we should probably give you chemo. And I was like, yeah, but to be honest with you, I don't want a third time to take me out. So I'm good. I've had 10 years of having my own breasts. Thank you very much for that. But bilaterally, you found that it's in the other breast. You can take them because right now I know I'm going to live and know that I didn't die from breast cancer. And I'm really grateful 
for the doctors and the scans every six months. I'm grateful for all of that, but I don't want to go through it anymore. And I can make that decision. And I know it's a hard one to make as a woman, but I also felt way more empowered of making that decision in the time that I was healthy and just had to do the surgeries, which weren't easy and the transitions and the lack of female, you don't feel all of that was a ebb and flow. But to know that cancer is never going to be talked about when it comes to breast cancer, it's gone. Um, I loved that part. That was the best part of the whole operation. Um, but you know, that was gone and the scars in the back were there on the same day, but I didn't care. I was just like, is the cancer on? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, yay. You know, <laughs> I was like, yay. Give me yeah. that <laughs> And in terms of managing your menopause, what, so, so now you, you talk about it obviously, um, but you take a, a body, ident- a, sorry, a bioidentical, uh, treatment. Yes, I take bioidenticals, um, and I'm actually going to a different doctor that that works a little bit more like the doctor my sister had when she was in L.A., and it is kind of more of a athletic, um, I want to say, uh, hormone doctor. So they look at all of your blood and not just a little bit here and there, the average stuff. They look at every single thing and they want to fine tune your body to be the best you can be. So everything lacking, they think about and they put a recipe each three months for you. Um, And the doctor I had prior to this, he was giving me a pellet. So every three months I had a pellet and I would take the progesterone um, pills every night. And it's great. It's wonderful, but it's not as balanced as a daily regime. And I think it's important to uh, do what is best for you um, that you can best serve yourself, uh, but not feel freaked out because I will say I found out I had no more hormones. I had nothing. I was zero and I didn't realize I was zero, but I was feeling zero um, in hormones. And that's not a healthy Mm -hmm. place to be in. But I think a lot of women that are in that place, they may have kids, they've got a lot of jobs and they've got a husband and they've got everything else pulling at them. So they don't feel that that feeling is because they have zero anything in their body. You you attribute it to being busy. Yeah. And your lifestyle and you're tired and you're old and whatever. You find a million excuses. It's so understandable to put those excuses out there. I totally get it. But when I'm around my girls and I look at my friend and I'm like, you know, you're all the signs are pointing to you may need to just fill some fill some empty pockets that are in your in your body that need to be, you know, pumped up. Uh, And when I say that, it's just it's more vitamin related and um, just the DNA of your body is breaking down and you need to help it. Just like you do with all of those creams for your face, ladies, all of those wonderful uh, stuff you buy religiously for your nighttime daytime routine, your face, who cares about it if you literally have no motive to live or no sexual drive or no memory? Like, who cares if I have a line in my face? (laughs) You know, I'm like, you have to think about the things we put time into and how wouldn't have to stress as much if everything totally. felt better. Like my life is so different than when, you know, when I was given what I was missing, what I had none of. Yeah. Replacing what was what mother nature cruelly takes away from us. In fact, I'm not going to stop calling her mother nature because no woman would do this to another woman. Right. <laughs> I just hope that speaking about stuff and saying this and being um, so influential, influential like you are to say that and me go high five girl. I relate that another woman can go, okay, I hear these two women talking. Um, this, it, you know, I may have felt a little bit leery about doing anything about it, but these two strong women are going, yeah, we tried to handle it like a dude and you know, it's not possible. We're human. No, it's not. Now, thank you for sharing that because for anybody that does worry that, that a treatment is not 
an option for them because of breast cancer. I just really want them to hear your experience so they can go yes. and investigate for themselves what's out there for them. Please do. There's always some stuff that they can help you with, even if it's not exactly what, because I think everyone's kind of steering away from that anyway. Yeah. Um, they're kind of going more to the holistic side and that is much more healthy for everyone's body. Um, but I do feel that uh, that cancer patients are not left outside alone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On that note, thank you so much. Enjoy your gig in Dusseldorf this evening. It's so good to see you. It's really good to see you. And I'm glad you still have your brains inside your head. Well, well they're inside yeah. there, whether or not they do much. I don't know, babe. 